All right. <clears throat> I received a question earlier this week regarding tithing. And, um, you know, I answered the question, but I realized I haven't preached on this subject in a while. I kind of went back to see, like, how long has it been since I've hit this subject. And honestly, you know, it's not at the, the forefront of my thoughts, you know, like the, the money that comes in. We've always had enough money to operate this church. It's, money's never been an issue. It never is. But I don't uh, apologize for preaching on money or preaching on tithing ever anyways, because everything that's in the Bible I'm going to preach on, and I'm going to preach on it firmly and strongly. And, you know, you could decide for yourself whether I'm, a, I'm someone who has a love of money and all I care about is the money coming because that's what the false prophets do. The Bible talks about the false prophets that teach for filthy lucre's sake. And what that means is that they change the message. They actually change, they'll, they'll withhold parts of the Bible. They'll only talk about some things. Why? Because all they care about is the money that comes in. So they want to make people happy. They want to be a man pleaser just to not scare off anybody that might be putting in a lot of money in the offering plate. Okay, that's wicked and that's wrong. But I think you could judge for yourself whether or not that's my motivation, that's my goal in, as being a pastor of this church. Okay? Which is one of the reasons why money doesn't come up that much when I preach because it's not my focus. But there are times, especially when people don't quite know, hey, what does the Bible say about this? What should I be doing? I don't quite understand. Well, hey, there's a very good reason to teach on a, a, a sermon about the subject then. And that's what we're going to do this morning. I'm going to, I'm going to teach on tithing. What, what, what does tithe even mean? A tithe means, literally, it's 10%. That's what a tithe is. Just an old word, it means 10%. And we're going to look at Old Testament tithing, and we're going to apply it and look at it in the New Testament as well. This is something that, and look, you, you know, you, whatever you do, I just want to get this off right, right in, the, in, the, in, in the beginning of the sermon, whatever you do is between you and God. Right. That's totally between, I am not ever going to come up to you and say, where's your tithe? You, you look, some churches do that. Some churches will actually harass people to be like, oh, why aren't you, you know, I will never do that to you. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I don't care. The extent that I care about you tithing is just to my extent of just you being right with God, which is why I'm preaching about it this morning. But as with every subject that I preach, you decide what you're going to do with it. The way that you behave yourself, the things that you do, sins that I preach about in the Bible, hey, it's up to you whether or not you're going to listen or not. I mean, that, that's your call. Amen. So I'm going to teach this morning, and I want you to follow along, and I want you to determine for yourself if what I'm teaching is true. And then you decide what you're going to do with that. Now, we started off in 2 Corinthians 9. And, and see, one of the problems with this subject is that um, it's not really a problem. It's just, it's a reality. These days, you've got so many people online, on the Internet, that, are, that have their specific agendas that they, that they want to push. And a lot of people who, who are not necessarily really grounded or founded in certain subjects, it's easy to come across this, in, this stuff. And people have been attacking tithing for a long time now. So it's easy to find this information and it's easy to get straight away into, into just a completely unbiblical concept here of that the saying that the, the, the tithe is no longer um, part of the New Testament, that it's been done away with, with, with the uh, Old Testament Levitical priesthood. But we're we're going to get into that and I'm going to explain to you why that's not true. And now the, the, the majority of people who are, who are making this claim it's, it's typically found in this house church movement, which there's nothing wrong with having church in a house at all. Our church started in a house. We were in my house for two years. There's nothing wrong with that. It's not, it's, it has nothing to do with the building. But see, that's, and that's the thing, though. The Bible doesn't say anything about the building being important because the church is the people. The church is us. It's you and me. That's what matters, to have a good church. The locate, we could meet under a tree, we could meet in a building here, we could meet back at my house. It doesn't matter what building you're located in, but the house church movement thinks it does matter what building you're in, that you do have to be in your house. That that's, if you're not in, your, in a house, then you're not scriptural. And that's ridiculous. But see, the other thing that they believe is that they don't think that pastors should be paid and working full time, just completely dedicated for doing the work of the Lord, and, and, and operating everything that goes along with the church, and they think, well, no, you should just be working and having your own secular job 
in addition to pastoring. Now, that's what I do right now. But I'll tell you right now, that's not my goal to just stay working full time at my, with my current employer and only being, being limited with how much I can do for the church because I'm working full time. And you'll have to ask yourself too, if you love this church, wouldn't you want somebody to be working full time? I mean, it only makes sense. And I'm going to get into that. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. That comes a little bit later. But that's, this is the, the, the reason why they don't believe in tithing. It goes hand in hand with a, with a pastor not being paid to do the work that they're doing. So let's dig into this. Uh, I started with 2 Corinthians chapter 9 because this is one of the most common places that someone will turn to to tell you that, oh, you don't need to tithe. And the reason why I'm starting here because this actually has nothing to do with tithing. And we're going to see from the context that this is not talking about a tithe. In this story, in the context, what the Apostle Paul is saying, he's, he's talking to this church at Corinth and saying, get together your, you know, uh, your bounty, he calls it. You're, you're, they're collecting money so that when Paul shows up, he's going to bring that money to saints in another area to other people that need it, not with their church, not to their local bed, just, just sending it off to like someone else. Similar to what we do right now when we take a missions offering. So on Wednesday night, we, we take an offering. I take a, a collection. And that collection, that money that is taken in on Wednesday evening, it goes 100% outside of this church. All of it is, is sent away to someone else who's off on a foreign mission field or do, you know, doing some type of evangelistic work to help support them in doing the work that they're doing. That's what we're doing with that money. But that is not called a tithe in the Bible. When you look at, um, even in the Old Testament, when people were bringing sacrifices and animals, you have your first fruits and your, your tithe that you're bringing in, but there's also all of these other offerings and all these other things that you're supposed to bring in. There's various meanings and different reasons why they did all of those various things. So it's not all just called one thing. And you also read in the Bible, and I'm not going to get into this very in depth, you could look it up on your own, the concept of giving alms. A-L-M-S, alms. Alms also is not a tithe. A tithe is something that you're giving you're paying to God of your increase. When God has blessed you and you're increasing, you are giving 10% of that increase to God. Alms is something you do to be generous, to be nice, to just help somebody out. The purpose of giving an alms, you know, if someone's, if someone's hungry and they need some food or whatever, they're going to ask for alms. They're going to ask you for a little bit of money and whatever you give them, that's not you giving your tithe to God that's you giving alms to a person. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, this falls into the alms category of, hey, these people are in need. These people need some help. Whatever you can spare, whatever you'd like to do, give to these people. And we're going to see the, these verses here. Let's, let's, start, let's just start in verse number 1. The Bible says, For as touching the ministering to the saints, it is superfluous for me to write to you. For I know the forwardness of your mind, for which I boast of you to them of Macedonia, that Achaia was ready a year ago, and your zeal hath provoked very many. Yet have I sent the brethren, lest our boasting of you should be in vain in this behalf, that as I said, you may be ready, lest haply if they have Macedonia come with me and find you unprepared. We that we say not ye should be ashamed in this same confident boasting. Therefore I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren that they would go before unto you, and make up beforehand your bounty, whereof you had noticed before, that the same might be ready as a matter of bounty and not as of covetousness. So he's saying, I, I sent people ahead of time. I'm giving you prepared. I'm giving you some time. Send people to let you know, hey, we're going to be taking up a collection. So get everything ready. Get everything ready to go. And that uh, this is a matter of bounty. This is like an extra supply, Right? and not of covetousness, not greediness or covetousness. Verse number six says, But this I say, he which soweth sparingly shall reap also sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. And he's, he's giving him, them a little, a little um, instruction and advice, I guess, if you will, on, on how they ought to be giving. 
because they're going to help a good cause. They're going to help other people. He's saying, look, when you just sow seeds in the ground, if you want fruit to come as a result of those seeds, the more you're sowing, the more you're going to be able to expect to reap. But if you're just throwing out, we just, we just gra put grass seed down in our backyard. And we actually, we got a good deal on the grass seed, and it was like, you get like twice the size for just like a little bit more money. It's kind of crazy. So we have way more seed than we need. So we're out there just sowing bountifully because we want all this grass. We don't want it to grow up spotty. We don't want it to have like sections where stuff missing. We've got all the seed. Hey, we're going we're gonna to sow bountifully. But if I was going out there and being like, here's a grass seed for this spot. Here's one for, you know, like, and I'm really like, oh, I don't know. I only got, I only got 10,000 seeds left. I'm going to put this one right here, you know. I'm not gonna, there's not going to be that much grass growing. You need, if you want a lot, a big bountiful, you know, a big reaping or whatever, you've got you to sow bountifully. And that's what he's saying here. He's, he's equating that, saying, look, these people are doing a good work. If you're going to help them out, be, and, and this is what we do, especially with the missions work. The concept is that this person, so some person who's working full time to win souls, is literally doing that. They're doing the work of the Lord. They're getting people saved. So when you are giving money to support that person that they, so that they don't have to go out and work, they could do even more work for the Lord. And God gives you, in a, in a sense, a little bit of credit for some of the work that they're doing because you're supporting them and because you're helping them. It's, it's a fruit that abounds unto your account. And, that, and that's totally scriptural and biblical. And that's why the Apostle Paul is saying, look, if you sow bountifully, you're going to reap bountifully. So if you're going to be generous and help these people out, you're going to help them do that much more, and then you'll be able to reap as a result, you know, an extension of what they're doing. That's a concept. That's, this is the reason what he's, what he's putting into their mind. But that's for the use of the money that is completely different than what the tithe was ever intended for. Let's keep reading here, though, in verse number seven. Every man, according as he... And this is the verse that they want to pull out of context, by the way. Every man as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. Now, see, the Bible says you don't have to give of necessity, and a tithe is, is you have to pay 10%. So the tithe's been done away in the New, the New Testament. That's what they say. They take this one verse and say, see, but is this ever talking about the tithe? No. So when you're giving alms, when you're giving to help people out, when you're giving to missions, whatever you're, whatever you're giving for, it's like the free will offering. Do you know that in the Old Testament there's a free will offering? Do you know what that means? Free will. It means it's up to you if you want to give something or not. That is actually not a commanded sacrifice. Not to, there's a sin offering and God says, this is what you have to do. The people had to give their tithe. They had to do other things. But the free will offering was completely voluntary up to them. Almsgiving, completely voluntary up to you. And God's saying, he's saying, look, don't feel like you have to just give this money to someone else. Like if, you, if you're going to be hold, you know, not okay with it and not actually happy about helping someone else out, then don't give. He said, I'd rather you not give this money to help people out if you're going to have a bad attitude about it, a bad heart about it. If you're willing to help people out, be happy about it, give, and give cheerfully, and don't feel constrained like I just have to give this money to help these people out. And this is talking about almsgiving. So don't let someone rip verses out of context and just try to prove some false doctrine and say, oh yeah, this, this is why you don't have to tithe. It shows either their ignorance of Scripture or their motivation to try to prop up a false doctrine and not care and have integrity about what the word actually says and not being honest about what the Bible actually says. Verse 8 says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye always having all sufficiency in all things may abound every good work. For it is written, He hath dispersed abroad, He hath given to the poor, His righteousness remains. And he's basically kind of telling them that they don't even need to worry about the money. Like it's not something they should be stressing about because God's able to, to bless them anyways. And verse number 10 says, Now he that ministereth, ministereth seed to the sower, both minister bread for your food, and multiply your seed sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. And this is the blessing that comes upon them who's giving the seed to the sower, right? If you've got someone who's going to be sowing, like, okay, I'm going to be sowing all day long. 
but I don't have the resources to buy the seed and to go out and sow all day long. So he's saying, you're ministering seed under the sower. You got someone out in the fields knocking on doors, talking to people, preaching the gospel. Well, by providing the seed, if you will, by allowing them to have resources and a place to stay and food to eat and everything else, you're, you're ministering seed to the sower. That's, that's why he keeps bringing up these various examples. So, um, and you could read the rest of this. We read the whole thing uh, this morning, but I want to go back now to Leviticus chapter 27. I wanted to start here just to show you how these passages are taken out of context. Trying to, to disprove tithing and trying, trying to prop up their false doctrine. We're going to see a little bit of how tithing was done in the Old Testament. And quite honestly, it's done a little bit different in the Old Testament than, we're doing, than we practice the tithing today. And there's good reasons for that. But let's, let's look at it real quickly here in, in Leviticus 27. We're going to spend a little bit of time in the Old Testament before coming back to the New Testament. Leviticus 27, verse number 30. The Bible says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. It is holy unto the Lord. And if a man will at all redeem aught of his tithe, he shall add the, the, thereto the fifth part thereof. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passes under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. Now, the reason why I'm turning here is I want to show you that the tithe is the Lord's. The people want to tell you that Oh, the tithe has been taken away because we no longer are under a Levitical priesthood. So the Levites aren't here to support anymore. So we don't need to pay a tithe because we're the Levites. Well, the tithe is actually the Lord's anyway. The tithe is something that, that you are paying to God. Amen. That, is the, that is the main primary uh, purpose anyways. Right. Now, the tithe also does support the Levites. There, the, you know, there is another purpose that we're going to get in that in a minute. Turn if you go to Numbers chapter 18, but it's very, very clear from the Bible that the tithe belongs to God. It's his. It's something that he says, I want you to do this. This belongs to me. Uh, I don't have this in my notes, but in Malachi chapter 3, it says, well, a man robbed God, yet ye have robbed me. And he says, well, what, you know, and they're like, what do you mean? Like, we didn't rob you, God. What are you talking about? Like, how do we rob you? And he said, in tithes and in offerings, he says, you, you, you know, you're not giving, you're not paying your tithe that belongs to me. So when you withhold your tithe, you're, you're not paying God what, what is his, what belongs to him. Right. See, we, we get paid, uh, you know, I, I get paid, I get paid my paycheck. And every time I, I get my paycheck, I have money that's just withhold, just, just, I don't even get and I look at that, it's like the government trying to be God. It's the government saying, well, this belongs to me. Here, you could have the rest. Now, if it was God doing that, I'd say, okay, God, right. you're God. I mean, this belongs to you. And that's what he's saying with the tithe. He says, you know what? Whatever, whatever you've increased, whatever I've blessed you with, one-tenth of that belongs to me. Belongs to me. I blessed you with it. And you could get into the different motivations why God, you know, God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need your cattle. He doesn't need your food. But he wants your obedience. He wants you to have faith in him. He wants you to be able to realize that we can trust in him completely. Because the problem, you know, I think the biggest problem that people have that I've seen with tithing is typically because you don't have very much money. It's one of the, the main reasons why a lot of people don't want to tithe because they say, well, I can't, I mean, I don't know how I'm going to get by. I only have X amount of dollars to get through the week, to get through the month. How in the world, and I'm already struggling, how in the world am I going to survive if I'm giving God, you know, a tenth of what I have already? And this is, this is the thinking, this is the mindset that a lot of people have and it causes them to not do what's right and to give God what is his. And that's why Malachi 3 is saying, look, you know, you're robbing me. You're like stealing from God when you're not giving him what belongs to him out of your increase. And over and over again, you'll find God's statements and his encouragement of just saying, look, just prove me. And in Malachi 3, it's the same thing. Look, prove me. 
Test it out. I'll show you that I can bless you even more, that everything can work out for you if you would just be faithful and obey. Just even if I don't know how things are going to work out, I'm just going to do what's right because it's, it's written in the Bible, because God said so. And if I'm doing what's right, then I don't have to worry about my finances or anything else. God will take care of me. At the end of the day, I'll be taken care of. It's so easy to say that to other people, right? It's so easy to, to read about that and, and, and to read the words. But it's another thing to actually do it. And, and we got to just not be afraid. Don't be scared about what's going to happen. Just trust and have faith in God that he will take care of you. Did I have you turn to Numbers 18? Yeah. Good. Numbers 18. We're going to see here, you know, I was mentioning that the, the tithe belongs unto the Lord. Even the Levites paid tithes. Now, the Levites were the one who were participating and receiving of the tithe. They were the ones being supported by the tithe, but even they paid a tithe. So if it was all about the Levites, then why did they have to pay a tithe? Look at verse number 23 of chapter 18. Verse number 23, the Bible reads, But the Levites shall do the service of the tabernacle of the congregation and they shall bear their iniquity it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations that among the children of israel they have no inheritance but the tithes of the children of israel which they offer as an heave off excuse me heave offering unto the lord i have given to the levites to inherit therefore i have said unto them among the children of israel they shall have no inheritance and the lord spake unto moses saying Thus speak unto the Levites and say unto them, When ye take of the children of Israel the tithes, which I have given you from them for your inheritance, then ye shall offer up an heave offering of it for the Lord, even a tenth part of the tithe. And this your heave offering shall be reckoned unto you as though it were the corn of the threshing floor and as the fullness of the winepress. Thus ye also shall offer an heave offering unto the Lord of all your tithes, which ye receive of the children of Israel, and ye shall give thereof the Lord's heave offering to Aaron the priest. Out of all your gifts ye shall offer every heave offering of the Lord, of all the best thereof, even the hallowed part thereof out of it. Therefore thou shalt say unto them, when ye have heaved the best thereof from it, then it shall be counted unto the Levites as the increase of the threshing floor and as the increase of the winepress. So what's all this saying? The Levites, it was the, the, tribe, the tribe of Levi were chosen to be ministers unto God. When the children of Israel came into the promised land, God gave them their inheritance, which was their land. So all the various tribes, the 12 tribes of Israel, had a, a section of land mapped off and said, okay, here's your land, here's your, this is your inheritance, this land belongs to you. And from the land, you can cultivate crops, you could, you could, you know, be a husbandman and have animals and livestock, and you can gain wealth that way, right? That's their land, it belongs to them. They're not being taxed by some government to own land, they actually own the land, it was theirs. And whatever they could do with the land, amen, God could bless them and increase what they're doing, and they could make their wealth that way. The Levites didn't have that. They didn't have an inheritance. They didn't have a land to say, this is my land. Why? Because God chose them. He called them out and said, no, you're going to work for me. Someone needs to be running the operation that God set up with God's house at his tabernacle in order to offer up the beasts, offer up the sacrifice. I mean, people have sin offerings. It needs to be done. Someone needs to be, to be offering up and cutting up the sacrifice and doing everything the way that God has set forth for it to be done. And that was the Levite's job. They reared up the tabernacle. They brought it down when they moved. You know, all of the work that was involved was all dedicated to the Levites. He says, you're working for me full time. And as a result of that, you don't have time to go go off and, and work the land and do everything else. I want you here working for me. And that's what they did. So the tithe that was coming in supported the Levites. God said, okay, you all are working and I'm blessing you and I'm multiplying things. I'm increasing what you're doing. So you need to bring in one-tenth of what I bless you with because your brothers over here, the Levites, they need to be able to eat too. And they don't have land. So you're going to support what the work that they're doing. 
you know, 11 out of the 12 tribes were all coming together and helping out that one tribe to be able to do the work of the Lord. And that's what's happening. But, but God's saying, okay, even though they're receiving these tithes, so as they would get them in, people would bring in their crops, they'd bring in their animals, they'd bring in, you know, all these various things that was a tenth of, what, of, of their own goods. God said, okay, the Levites, the food that comes in, it's just as if you were threshing the corn yourself, that you were going out and you were growing this stuff. This is your increase now. It's the same thing. Treat it just like they treat it when they actually go out and harvest it. Now you're going to say, okay, this is what came in. One-tenth is going to the Lord. It doesn't come back to them. The one-tenth goes to the Lord. He's saying this, this, is, this is God's showing that, look, it's all God. The tenth he cares about. God decides to use that tithe to support the Levites that comes in from everyone else, but he still says, like, you still got to give a tithe, Levites, Levites, because it belongs to him, because he wants everybody being faithful in this act, in doing this. And this is why, you know, I, um, I'm receiving some compensation finally this year is for, for some of the work that I'm doing, and wh whatever I receive, guess what? I tithe on what I receive from the church to do the work of God because the same way that the Levites did um, here in Numbers. Turn, if you would, to Deuteronomy chapter 12. We're going to see here in Deuteronomy how God is going to determine where his house is going to be, where his tabernacle is going to be where he wants people to come and worship, where he wants the, the sacrifices to be done. And the place that God determines, he's saying, you need to bring your tithe to that place. Look at verse number five of Deuteronomy chapter 12. The Bible reads, But unto the place which the Lord your God shall choose out of all your tribes, to put his name there, even unto his habitation shall ye seek, and thither thou shalt come. And thither ye shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices and your tithes and heave offerings of your hand, and your vows, and your free will offerings, and the firstlings of your herds and of your flocks. And there ye shall eat before the Lord your God, and ye shall rejoice in all that ye put your hand unto, ye and your households, wherein the Lord thy God hath blessed thee. So the tithes are part of it, but everything that they did, all their offerings, he's saying, you need to go to this place, and that's where you're going to do it. And not only that, though, it wasn't just all give. They got to partake in the feasts and stuff. They would bring their sin offerings, they would bring their tithes, and they actually got to sit down and when the, when the animal sacrifice was made or the food was brought in, they got to sit down and have a meal with them too. Okay, they participated with them while the Levites being taken care of. Completely scriptural, completely biblical. But what, one of the points I want to make here, because we're applying some of these concepts to the New Testament before I even just get in completely to the New Testament, is that they bring their tithe. They didn't mail it in. They didn't send it in. They actually brought it. They physically came and brought it. And I believe that um, when you give or pay your tithe, that you should be bringing it to church. You should be bringing it to the house of God and not just sending it off. I think that's the scriptural way that it'll be done. Look at verse number 19. Jump down to verse number 19. The Bible says, Take heed to thyself that thou forsake not the Levite as long as thou livest upon the earth. So it's one last command. It's all about tithing. You can, re again, read that whole chapter later in context. But God's trying to make sure, look, don't forsake the minister of the Lord. Don't forsake the Levite. Don't just hold that tithe back to yourself because then you're going to be starving out the, the people doing the service of the Lord by not giving that tithe. They're saying, don't forsake them. Turn, if you would, just a couple chapters over to chapter 14, Deuteronomy chapter 14. We're going to see here that God the tithe provided not only for the minister of God or the Levite, but it also provided for the fatherless and widows. Look at Deuteronomy 14, verse number 22. The Bible reads, Thou shalt truly tithe all the increase of thy seed that the field bringeth forth year by year, and thou shalt eat before the Lord thy God in the place which, which he shall choose to place his name there. The tithe of thy corn, of thy wine, and of thine oil and the firstlings of thy herds and of thy flocks, that thou mayest learn to fear the Lord thy God always. And if the way be too long for thee, so that thou art not able to carry it, or if the place be too far from thee, 
which the Lord thy God shall choose to set his name there, when the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, then shalt thou turn it into money, and bind up the money in thine hand, and shalt go unto the place which the Lord thy God shall choose. And thou shalt bestow that money for whatsoever thy soul lusteth after, for oxen, for sheep, for wine, for strong drink, or for whatsoever thy soul desireth. And thou shalt eat there before the Lord thy God, and thou shalt rejoice, thou and thine household. And the Levite that is within thy gates, thou shalt not forsake him, for he hath no part nor inheritance with thee. At the end of three years, thou shalt bring forth all the tithe of thine increase the same year, and shalt lay it up within thy gates. And the Levite, because he hath no part nor inheritance with thee, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow, which are within thy gates, shall come and shall eat and be satisfied, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hand, which thou doest. So there's a few things mentioned here in this passage. He's one of the things he's saying, look, if it's too far for you to go, I mean, if you're way at the north end of Israel and, and God sets up his tabernacle on the south end, you know, you've got to travel this long distance and you don't want to haul the literal first fruits like, well, here's what I brought in from my crops. Here are the animals and we're going to make this really long trek. If that's just too burdensome, you've got too much stuff, maybe God's really blessed you a lot. He's saying, it's fine, just convert it to money, sell it, right? Get the value of however God has increased you, whether it be animals, you know, crop, whatever it is. Take the value of that, take it in money, because money's a lot easier to carry. Bring it to the place that God wants you to go. And then there he's saying, then you can buy whatever it is that you want to use is the offering and the sacrifice giving unto the Levites. Now, here's where a lot of people have a problem as well. And they say, well, I mean, if we're really going to be tithing, then why aren't we bringing in our cattle and our, in a, you know, it's like, well, because our economy is different. It just makes sense. I mean, the economy of the time in that day, the, the, the land of Israel, children of Israel, it was, it was agriculture. I mean, they, they, they were growing their own food and had their own animals. And you know what? If that's the way that society was today, I mean, if that's pretty much what we're doing here, then yeah, we'd probably do the same thing. Because what do you need? You know, the only reason that you need the money anyways is to get the things that you need. If people are bringing you the things that you need and it's truly a tenth of your increase, then great. They're bringing you the animals. They're bringing you this, you know, the crops. That's what they need. So they don't need money from them to go out and just buy these things. Because what are they going to do? They're going to turn around and buy it from the people who are bringing it anyways. Because they're the ones that are supplying it. So it's just, it, it, it just, I mean, it makes perfect sense for, for where they were. But things are so different today, it, it, just in, in regards to the way that people live and where our food comes from and, you know, and all those things that money is much more important in our marketplace. And it's, you know, so it's, it's just the system people use. And God didn't even have a problem with them converting things to money and then, and then converting it back. Like that wasn't, that wasn't the issue with God. It was just making sure that the Levites are being taken care of. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. Now we're going to get a little bit into some of the, in the New Testament passages. 1 Timothy 5, and also put a finger or a bookmark in Mark chapter 7. So I want to I prove all things. I want to prove all the reasons why I believe what we should be doing um, today. Now, we read a lot of the Old Testament here, and it's saying, and, and oh, the other thing is that they tithe every three years, which again, that makes sense when you have to travel long distances. You know, God doesn't necessarily want you just, just having to go all the time to bring that in. It, it made sense, okay, every three years. Now, everyone wasn't all on the same three-year time frame. So you have some people, so every year you got people still coming in and giving their tithes at all different times, right? Depending on how they've been blessed and when they're, three, you know, because it's every three years, it's not the exact same three. So it's not like there's getting this huge bounty every three years from every single person. It goes, you know, it, 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 uh, it balances itself out. But, um, Again, it has to do with logistics and just the way things would work out at the time. It makes, it makes perfect sense. Um, also, their increase 
you know, when you're, when you're growing crops or animals are being born, that's not something that happens every week. You're not, you know, you're not, you're not going out and, and, and harvesting on a weekly basis and, and you're getting increased every week. You're getting increased like once a year, typically. I mean, that's like, that's what you're, what you're getting increased with. So he's, he's allowing you to go three years to, to bring it in. So um, you say, oh, well, you know, you tithe every week. Well, I'm, get, I'm increased every week. I'm, it's in a, it's in a, it's in a, a, a value that, that is easy to deal with. It's in money and it, and, and it is an increase. But um, I, w- I just want to show you here in 1 Timothy chapter 5 because in Deuteronomy 14, it talks about the taking care of the fatherless and the widows in addition to the Levite. And we're going to see in 1 Timothy chapter 5 that the church, the New Testament church, you say, oh, this is all old, old, old Testament. It doesn't mean anything. Well, the New Testament church is charged with the same things that the Old, that the old Testament church was charged with. Caring for the widows. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse number 3. The Bible says, honor widows that are widows indeed. And I've, and I've brought this up many times because it's important to get this point across. That word honor does not always just mean respect. It's a taking care of. And to prove this to you, you, have your, you keep your place in 1 Timothy 5 because we're coming back to it. But I want to prove what I'm saying. Turn, if you would, to Mark chapter 7. We're going to see Jesus rebuke the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees, what, what they were known for, they put the doctrines of men before the doctrines of God. So they cared about their own rules and, and their own thoughts and their own beliefs above what the Bible actually said. They would actually make God's word of none effect by their own rules, by their own laws. And in this case, Jesus is going to rebuke them for not following one of the Ten Commandments. Right? We all know the Ten Commandments. Honor thy father and thy mother. And again, most people have read that and will say, oh, that just means you have to respect them. That's not all it means because look at the way that Jesus rebukes the Pharisees. If it was just talking about just having respect towards them, then he would have said, see, you're not talking to them right. You're, you're not showing them respect by, you know, in the way that you communicate with them. That's not what he says. Look at chapter, verse number 9 of Mark chapter 7. The Bible reads, And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. So he's quoting the law. Two aspects of the law. One, honor your father and mother. And two, if you curse your father and mother, then, then you ought to be put to death. Those are the two laws that he's saying they're rejecting. Look at verse number 11. But ye say, so this is what you're doing. This is what the Bible says. That's what Moses said. But here's what you're doing. If a man shall say to his father or mother, it is korban. So they came up with this word. Oh, it's korban. That is to say a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me. He shall be free. So the way that they are neglecting God's word is just by saying, oh, count it lucky. Just consider it a gift Whatever I do for you that you could profit from. Think about the word profit. What, what, what are you profiting from? Being blessed by, getting angry. You know, that's more than just the way that you speak to them. Right? Whatever it is that you're profited by me, you just consider that a gift. Count yourself lucky that I'm doing anything for you. As opposed to it being your duty and your responsibility to take care of your father and your mother. Because that's what God's trying to get across, saying it's your responsibility. If you're a child, your parents raised you, they took care of you. When they get older, it's your job and your responsibility to take care of them. That's who it belongs to. And then it says in verse 12, and he suffer him no more to do aught for his father or mother. And you, you, don't, you don't even make them do anything more for their parents. Not how you talk to them, not how you treat them, not that type of honor. This honor that they're disobeying is not taking care of them financially, if you will, right? Making sure all their needs are met. Verse number 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have delivered, and many such like things do ye. 
Go back, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 5. So we see very clearly there Jesus Christ himself saying they're disobeying the commandment to, to honor your father and mother by not supporting and taking care of their parents and calling it a gift as opposed to a duty anytime they do anything for them. They're negating the word of God. So when the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 3, honor widows that are widows indeed, it doesn't just say, oh, you're a widow. We love you, you're doing a good job, and we're going to talk to you nicely. It means take care of them. Because a widow, and typically, this is, you can see here, it's, it's referring to a female, someone who can't, you know, who's not going out and working for themselves. Like a man could go off and work for himself, but the way that God has it laid out here, he's saying, look, you know, widows, their husband was providing for them. Now they have no one to provide for them, so they need to be taken care of. And he gives the requirements here. Read verse number, we're going to start again in verse number four, 1 Timothy 5, of, of who the church is really supposed to be taken care of. Verse number four says, But if any widow have children or nephews, let them learn first to show piety at home and to requite their parents, for that is good and acceptable for God. So he's saying, look, if you're a widow, but you have children, you have nephews, you have other family members, you have close, close kin to take care of you, let them take care of you. So that's, that's the right thing. Verse number five, now she that is a widow indeed, because remember verse three said that we need to honor widows that are widows indeed. So it's going to define what a widow indeed is. Now she that is a widow indeed and desolate trusteth in God and continueth in supplications and prayers night and day. This is someone who's a godly person. Continuing in supplications and prayers. Right? They're praying to God. They're relying on God. Verse number six, but she that liveth in pleasure is dead while she liveth. And these things give in charge that they may be blameless. But if any provide not for his own, especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. Let not a widow be taken into the number under three score years old. So the widow has to be at least 60 years old. That's what three score is. Having been the wife of one man, well reported of for good works. She's a good person. Helps people out. Does good works. She have brought up children, if she have lodged strangers, right, real hospitable, if she have washed the saints' feet, if she have relieved the afflicted, if she have diligently followed every good work. This is the person that the church is being charged with to take care of if they meet all this criteria saying, okay, you're a widow indeed. If you don't have any other family members to take care of you, if, you, if you've been living a good life, if you've been living a righteous life, if you've been doing the work for God, then you're a widow indeed. Jump down to verse number 16. The Bible says, If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them. And let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are widows indeed. So you're saying, you, if you have widows in your family, you take care of them and don't charge the church the task of taking care of the widow that is in your family. That's your responsibility. That's what it is. It's responsibility of taking care of people. All tied in with the use of that word, honor. Honor widows that are widows indeed. Take care of them. Look after them. Make sure they're provided for. Now, in that same passage, we're going to see here the elders, or elder is another word for a pastor. Verse number 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture saith, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. So what's God saying? The elder or the pastor who's working hard, if they're really working and laboring in the word and in doctrine and they're doing all this work, he's saying, let them be worthy of double honor. Double pay, if you will. It's, it's, you know, they're, they're, they're doing a good job. They're working hard. Pay him. The laborer is worthy of his reward. Turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, because we're going to see this other reference to the, pat, the scripture, thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. Because then people like to twist this around and say that it's, you know, that it's, it's not saying what it says. Look at verse number seven of 1 Corinthians chapter number nine. The Bible reads, Who goeth a warfare any time in his own charges? 
Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? He's saying, look, if, you've got, if you're growing your own crop, you're going to eat of the stuff that you're growing. If you have animals and you're getting you know, milk from cows or whatever, you're going to drink the milk that you're getting. You're gonna, you know, it, it's yours. You're, getting the, you're, you're, you're putting in all this time and effort and energy into the work that you're doing. You're going to receive back from the work that you're doing. And uh, it, it's not a mistake. It says, who feedeth the flock and eateth not of the milk thereof, of the flock? You know, the Bible uses the word pastor has to do with like a shepherd over a flock. And he's saying, who's going to, you know, if you're feeding the flock, you should be able to receive back a little bit from the work that you're doing of feeding the flock. Verse number eight, say I these things as a man or saith not the law the same also for it is written in the law of Moses, thou shalt not muzzle the, the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God take care for oxen or saith he it altogether for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? He ties it all together with that verse 11 because he keep, he's saying, look, it's even written in the law of Moses not to, not to muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. What's he talking about? An ox was used to stamp out corn and to make corn powder, right? And they would use that for their, their corn flour or whatever. They would use an animal to stamp it out. And he's saying, look, th that ox is doing all of this work for you. Don't put a muzzle on him so he can't dip his head down and eat a little bit of the food that he is, he's stamping all over and doing all that work for you. And then he's saying, look, why is, this in the law of why is this in God's law to begin with? Is it because he cares so much that the oxen gets to eat? He's saying he doesn't care. It's not about the ox that he wrote that in his law. He's saying it's for our sakes, no doubt. So there's not even a doubt about this. It's amazing what the, you know, the things that the Apostle Paul could say, this isn't even a doubt, whereas people today are like, well, you could interpret it however you want. No, you can't. It's, it's, it's obvious. God doesn't care about the oxen. That's a foolish thing to say that, oh, it's just so that they could eat. No, it's to apply it to you doing your work. And if you're doing work, if you're out there, you know, um, reaping and sowing and doing all that stuff, you ought to be able to receive a little bit of the work that you're doing. And he says, if we, now talking about himself and Barnabas or whoever's with him, you know, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, we're providing you spiritual meat. We're providing you spiritual food. We're preaching you the word of God. We're teaching you all this spiritual stuff. He's saying, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? I mean, things like money or food or whatever. Like, like, is that really that big of a deal? I mean, what really matters more anyways? Is it the word of God and, and getting more wisdom and getting more insight and knowing more about God and in, get, receiving instruction? Or is it just some money or some, you know, like, right. we don't care about those things. And he's saying, that's not the big deal. But it's like, like why are you making a big deal out of it? Just support the people who are, who are actually doing a hard work for you and helping you out in a way that's way better than getting all the riches of the world anyways. Right. Verse 12, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. So he's saying, now look, the Apostle Paul was not a pastor. He was not an elder. That's what people want to jump on that too. But he still had power because he was preaching the gospel to live of the gospel. He had that power to be able to do that. But he said, you know what? I'm not going to do that. He was going to be an example to show how you can work really hard and do both. You can work hard, you can preach the gospel, you can do all this stuff. And he's saying, I don't want that stuff. I'm going to get even more glory and honor by not receiving of you. I'm just going to do it this way. And look, the Apostle Paul chose to do that. And that's fine. And that's great. But that doesn't, he, he still said, look, oh, we still got the power to do it. Right. I mean, it's still completely right and legitimate for me to be receiving of you. I'm just choosing not to take it. Verse number 13. Do you not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple 
And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Saying, the people doing the service of God. And they say, oh, yeah, but he's talking about the, the, the temple. And you know, it's like, but he's relating it to today. This is the New Testament. He's not just saying, like, what would be the point of even bringing up the temple and everything if it had nothing to do with what they should be doing today? Why are you even teaching this, Paul? Oh, that was all Old Testament. Why are you bringing up the Old Testament and the Levites and the temple? Who cares about that stuff? There's a New Testament. Don't you know better, Paul? Don't you know that we don't, we don't, we don't care about that? That Yeah, when they ministered, they were partakers of the temple, but now we don't have a temple. Is anyone saying that to Paul? No. He says the same way that they did in verse 14, even so, that's what even so means, the same way that those that ministered at the, the temple of God were partakers because they ate of the sacrifices, they were taken care of, they were supported through, through doing the work they were doing, even so at the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In the same way as it was in the Old Testament that they were taken care of for doing the work of the Lord, the same way in the New Testament. That is not a disannulling of receiving, you know, uh, being taken care of or being honored in the New Testament. It's not, no, none of that is being done away with. It's actually reinforced time after time. 1 Timothy chapter 5, we saw that. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now let's turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9, because, hey, if we're going to look at a place in the New Testament that actually describes the changes to the law as the result of the change in the priesthood, why don't we go to the book that talks the most about it? Let's look at Hebrews. The book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews, the, the physical Israelites, the Jews, right? People that call themselves Hebrews. And the reason why I was written is so that they could get, because they were the ones practicing. You know, you have the, the epistles to the Romans, to the Corinthians, you know, to all these various Gentile churches who never observed and followed the Jewish laws anyways. They don't need the full explanation on the way everything was. They're saying, this is what you need to do. But the book of Hebrews really goes in depth into this is what it all meant. This was the whole purpose behind the laws, the, the sacrifices, everything that you were doing, and, the way, and, and what has changed and the way things are going to be done going forward. Because the religion didn't change. You're still worshiping the Lord, Jehovah, God Almighty, whatever name you want to call him. It's the same God. It's the same plan. It's the same plan of salvation. The Bible talks about Moses and the church that was in the wilderness. It talks about the, the Abraham being given the gospel. The Abraham believed God. It was counted him righteous. Look, those things haven't changed. It's the same religion. Salvation's by grace through faith alone. It always has been. But there are a few points that did change. There are a few things in the law that were done for a specific purpose, but that purpose was fulfilled when Jesus Christ finally came and fulfilled prophecies and fulfilled the foreshadowing that was done prior to that to where now we don't do those anymore because Christ already came. We don't need everything reiterated to us in the New Testament that's in the Old Testament to say, oh yeah, this still stands. We, we say that whatever God said is going to stand unless God says anything different, saying, okay, now this has changed a little bit. People want to say, oh, we're in the New Testament, so the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. That's not true at all. There's a lot of things not mentioned in the New Testament that still stand today. So the way, that, the way that we divide the word of truth here is that we look to see what did God say, where are the changes, where are the differences? And that's what we're going to observe. So unless I see someone saying, oh, tithing's done away in the New Testament because it says so right here, then it still is going to stand. Look at chapter 9, uh, verse number 6, Hebrews 9, 6. Now, when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But into the second went the high priest alone, once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. The Holy Ghost this signifying, that the way into the holiness, holiest of all was not yet made manifest while as the first tabernacle was yet standing. 
which was a figure for the time then present, in which were both offered gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So he's explaining that in the Old Testament, you had a high priest. He went once a year into the holiest of holies and he brought in a sacrifice. And this is the way that was done. He says, but the reason why all this was done was just to show you something. It was to teach something. He said, and he goes on to say that, you know, the, the sacrifices and the gifts that were offered, they didn't clear your sins. The sin offering didn't literally pay for your sins. It was a picture of what was to come, Jesus Christ, who was to come to pay for all of your sins once for all. And this is what, this is what Hebrews is explaining. what he's explaining in chapter number 9. Look at verse number 10. Which stood only in meats and drinks and divers washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. This is where you get the, the most clear verse of just saying that, look, this is what was going on then that was in place up until this specific time, the time of reformation, being reformed. The way that, the way that God's service was going to be uh, done and held is being reformed. So they had certain laws about meats and drinks, right? The, 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 um, what you can eat. You couldn't eat shellfish. You couldn't eat, you know, all these various types of foods. There's dietary restrictions. Divers washings. You read the Old Testament, read the Law of Moses, you're going to see the various, you know, being clean and unclean and everything else. And you have to, you know, if you touch a body, you're unclean until even and all, you know, all the various washings you had to do. Carnal ordinances. Again, carnal means fleshly, right? So the, the dealing with the, with the sacrifices and all this other stuff. They were imposed on them until this time of being reformed, when Christ would come and reform the church. Verse number 11, But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctify it to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? So this tells us what was changed. And it's also just clearly stating that Christ came in to fulfill this stuff. Flip back, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 7. I know there's a lot of scripture today, but I, wanna, I really want to make sure I'm proving this to you. And stay with me here because, I mean, the New Testament is going to be the most important part anyways. We saw the old, you know, people just want to throw out the Old Testament and say, oh, that doesn't apply. Well, we're looking at why it still applies. We're looking at why it, it's not being specified as being changed. And I'm, I'm going to drive home one more really important point here when it comes to the, the actual changes that were made. Hebrews chapter 7, look, we're going to start reading in verse number 12. We're going to see some more differences between the Old and New Testament. Verse number 12 says, for the priesthood being changed. There is made of necessity a change also of the law. So the priesthood was the children of Aaron, right? Aaron was of the tribe of Levi. The tribe of Levi was kind of split up into two groups. You were the, the, if you're children of, of Aaron, you'd be a part of the, priest, the priesthood. Everyone else was, was doing other service of the Lord. So because the priesthood is being changed, Jesus Christ is the high priest, but Jesus Christ was not of the tribe of Levi. He was a tribe of Judah. So he is not of that same priesthood line the way that God ordained, hey, all of your priests need to be of the, of the tribe of Levi, of the sons of Aaron. Jesus wasn't. He was born of the tribe of Judah. So the priesthood is being changed. It's being altered. So as a result of that, there's also a change of the law. Look at verse number 13. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect but the bringing in of a better hope did. 
by the which we draw nigh unto God. Now notice in general what this is talking about is regarding the law and the Mosaic law and how people cannot keep it basically because we're all sinners. This is why we needed a new covenant. This is why we need a new priesthood because all of the, the Old Testament laws, we're, we all fall short of that. And Jesus Christ was, was the one to come in and pay for that, uh, to pay for our sins. Look at verse number 20. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, and they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So in the, old, you know, the, the priesthood, there was many priests because they would die. I mean, they're human beings. So they would die, so there's another priest, another priest, another priest. There was a succession of priests. There's many priests. But Jesus Christ is one priest. And verse number 24 says, But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. He is the high priest that lasts forever because he's everlasting. Because he continues on forever. Verse 25, Wherefore he is able to save is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. He's always there as the high priest to make intercession for us to God. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests, which have infirmity, but the word of the oath, which was since the law, maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. Jesus is the new high priest. The old priesthood was of the tribe of Levi. The new priesthood is of the order of Melchizedek. And there's a whole sermon going back and looking at Melchizedek in the Old Testament, Genesis. There's a lot more there. We're not going to do any of that this morning. But because the priesthood has changed, well, people say, oh, there's no more tithe then, right? Because the, Levi, the Levites, I mean, you don't, you don't need to tithe. Well, let's see if there is a tithe with Melchizedek, right? Because it's the, now, now it's under the order of Melchizedek, which is Jesus Christ. Look, jump back up now in Hebrews 7 to verse number 1. We're going to see a little bit about Melchizedek, which is the new priesthood, the priesthood that we are under right now. The priesthood being changed is the order of Melchizedek. This is applicable to us today. Verse number 1, for this Melchizedek, King of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Now, again, Abraham is prior to Moses. So the Mosaic law that outlined the tithe and the Levi. I mean, Abraham was the father of Israel, not a son of Israel. Israel is the one who had the 12 tribes. Levi came out of Israel. Abraham is the progenitor. Abraham is way before Levi. So the reason why I'm pointing that out is because when Abraham meets Melchizedek, look what he does. Before the law is instituted of giving the tithe from the Mosaic law, verse number two, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all. First being by interpretation king of righteousness and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. Who's that talking about? Jesus. Named here as Melchizedek. Verse number four. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Wow, we see Abraham tithing to Jesus Christ. The tithe belongs to God. It belongs to to the order of Melchizedek also, which is the order that we're under today. Verse number five, And verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who receive the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. And as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham. 
The concept of giving tithes in this new priesthood is established here in Hebrews chapter 7. It's not done away with. It's established. Say, look, Abraham paid tithes to Jesus Christ. Why in the world would you say, oh, we're in a new, uh, over Melchizedek there is no tithing. That's funny because when Melchizedek was on this earth, Abraham gave him the tithe. Last place I'll have you turn, turn to Acts chapter 6. There is no evidence for the tithe being removed or done away with in the New Testament. The best you can get is some ambiguity on what is a carnal ordinance that we already read in Hebrews. Or you could try to use some reasoning and logic to say, well, the Levites aren't here, which benefited from that. <coughs> So why should we, you know, why do we have to tithe then? There's no more Levites. Well, we saw 1 Timothy chapter 5 that talks about taking care of the widows from the church being charged and the, the elders that rule well being worthy of double honor. And the whole point of the tithe was to support the men of God, support the people doing the service of the Lord. The Levite's full-time job was doing the service of the Lord. Doesn't it just make sense to have a preacher or pastor doing full-time service getting paid? And again, one more biblical example is in Acts chapter 6. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. So the, you know, the church grew by leaps and bounds. I mean, there's thousands of people being added to the church. And, of course, the Greeks were receiving Christ. So the Hebrews were used to taking care of their widows the way that they did, right, in the synagogue. But now the church has grown immensely, and there's more people to be taken care of. So the Greeks are like, hey, you know, we've got widows. We've got widows that need to be taken care of. Well, why aren't you guys taking care of them? You know, I thought this was the church's job, was to, take care of, was to take care of our widows. So here's what they did. Verse 2, it says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. So he's, they're saying, We've got a more important work to do right now than to go and take care of these widows because of the gifts that God has given them. Because we need to be going out and preaching the gospel and doing this other work. They're not saying that this work doesn't need to be done because they're going to appoint people to do that work. It is an important job. It's something that needs to be done. But he's saying, our job is not to go and do this. We need to be just completely dedicating ourselves to this service of God. Now, feeding you know, the widows and taking care of them is a good work to do. There's nothing wrong with it. It's a, it's a, it's a great thing to do, especially you know, if this is your job in the church or whatever, to, to, to do this role in this job. It's an important role. It's something that needs to be done. And if they're not going to do that, what makes you think they're going to say, oh, okay, well, we need to be dedicating ourselves to the Word and the Gospel. We don't even have time to take care of these widows, but, I, but hold on a second. I need to go to work. I need to go catch fish. I need to go do whatever other secular job. They're saying no to the widows for, for, because they don't want to take away from the other work that they're doing for God. You think they're going to say, oh, no, well, actually, I need, I need to go work my full-time job to support my family. No, of course not. Jesus Christ told Peter, you know, from henceforth, Thou shalt be a catcher of men. You know, he's not going to be a, a, a fisherman anymore, basically. He said, when, when Peter started to fall, he says, from this day forward, you are no longer going to be a fisherman because now you're going to catch men. This is the job I have for you to do. I don't want you going back to this job. And it wasn't just because it was a job of being a fisherman. It was any job. I have got a new work for you to do. Well, let's, uh, let's finish here in, in Acts chapter 6, verse number 2. It says, Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, Is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables? Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you, seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. 
So, um, you know, that's the way they handled that. Now, uh, just the last few points here. I know we're, we're a little bit over time, but um, just some, some practical things and some teaching that I uh, didn't quite get into to prove um, necessarily from Scripture. Because I just want to pr prove that tithing is, is still applicable today in the New Testament. It's something we should be doing. Tithing means a tenth. And you'll find over and over again that the Bible says that you need to tithe of the first fruits of your increase. Proverbs 3, 9 says, honor the Lord with thy substance and with, and there's that word again, honor. Honor the Lord with thy substance. Substance is what you have. And with the first fruits of all thine increase, so shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. He's saying, you'll be blessed. If you are obedient and you give God your tithe, he said, you'll be blessed. So you don't have to worry about, about running out of food or anything like that. Now, it's, it's constantly talking about our increase. And I'll just let you in a little bit the way that, that I do my tithing and, and the, way that, the way that I look at things and the way that I understand Scripture to, to, to what I tithe on. And this is exactly what I do. Anything that I receive that I'm not like putting money forth for is an increase. So like when people give me gifts, if my family members give me a gift, to me that's an increase. That's something I didn't have before that I just received. When I go to work, and I get paid my money. That's an increase. God has blessed my work and my job. That okay, this this is an increase. Anything along those lines. I look. At, I try to look at every aspect. We're growing a garden. Okay, it's just as, and this is <laughs> what was happening in you know in the scripture. What, whatever we receive, our fruits and our vegetables and the things that we get, I put a monetary value on that. I'm being increased. We're being blessed. All of that I take a tenth of and I pay to church because it belongs to God, not to me. Now, I also take the money that I earn before anyone else has their hands on it. So, as I mentioned earlier, you know, when I get my paycheck from my secular job, I don't get the full amount that I earned. Other things have been just automatically removed, one of them being things from the government, right? The Social Security, Medicare, FICA, whatever, all the different taxes and stuff. Just because someone comes in and takes my money doesn't mean I didn't earn that money. I'm not going to let the IRS get their hand in before God and, and say that, like, well, because they stole from me, I'm not going to give God his full 10%. So the way that I do it is I take my gross, not my net. I say, this is what I earned. I'm not happy about the government stealing from me, but they're not going to steal from me and from God. Okay? I'm going to make sure God gets his 10% of what I earned before anyone else gets their hand in my pot and takes away from it. And that goes, I mean, there's a lot of other things too. You could have 401k, you could have health benefits, you could have whatever else. Um, but also things to consider too is, you know, I have... I, I'm offered health insurance. If I take health insurance, there's an extra benefit to that that many people don't even think about that much. I'm paying in a certain portion, but my employer is also paying money for me to have this benefit. I factor in what my employer is paying. Or I have a 401k, they match funds, so whatever money I put in there, they're putting in money there as well. Hey, that's an increase. That's a benefit to me. That's an increase. I am increasing because ultimately it's part of my compensation for doing the job that I'm doing. All things to consider when, you know, what I believe, if you're going to do things right to tithe in it, that I believe is correct in the eyes of God. Make sure you're covering all your bases. And to be honest with you, what I, I, I really like tithing. I don't, I'm not saying that facetiously or anything. I, I really do enjoy it because the more you pay attention to the way God has blessed you, the happier you'll be. I mean, you realize like, like we are so humbled by how much we really receive. And when you're paying attention to all that God has done for you, it's hard to be upset <laughs> about even giving your tithe. Like, how do we have, we have all these things. God's, you know, people have been giving us stuff left and right or whatever. It's, it, and, and you really list it out and kind of put a value like, wow. Thank you, Lord. I, I don't have any problem, like, you know, just 
And, and, you know, we've been in various situations financially. We've been better. We've been worse. We've had, we've had our ups and downs. At no point did we ever stop giving God his money. And I think he's blessed us for that. And I know that he'll bless you for that too. The last point I want to make, I think I have everything else covered here, regards the people, you know, people ask a question as well about the IRS and, and you know, giving and all that stuff. Um, some people will say that if you... If you uh, itemize your giving that you give to the church, then it's like you're stealing from God in order to get a better, re bigger return from the government. That is completely false. When you're tithing on your gross, first of all, you're giving God what, what he gives you. What you're getting back from your taxes is you're getting back some of the money they stole from you. You're getting the money back from the government. You're not taking money back from God. What you gave to God went to God. So to use that information to get, to get a better return, I'm all for it. Go ahead and do it. I don't think there's anything unbiblical or unscriptural about that. People say, oh, your, your heart's not in the right place. You're giving just to get some, some tax benefit or something. I've never given just to give some, get some tax benefit. Not the church. You give because you want to give. Now, you might have some problem there if your motivation is just has to do with taxes, but I don't see how... I don't, I, don't, I don't even understand that mindset. But, or if you want to say, you know, and some people don't want to let the government know what they're doing, it's fine. Don't tell them. You know, we provide a giving statement at the end of every year to, let you, to, to help you out and to let you know, here's what we've, uh, what, we've, what, what we've recorded as you're giving. Now, this isn't public information, so you don't have to worry about people knowing what you get. Like, I'm the one who knows, and the people who count the offering writes down what we receive. If you want to be anonymous on things, that's completely fine. Some people do that. You can put cash, you know, if you want to give money at church and just be anonymous, put the cash in. Nobody knows, okay? And no one should be looking at what anyone else is giving. That's not the point. We keep the records to help you out so that I can provide you with, say, hey, here's what we've received. You can use this if you'd like to, 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 to itemize your deduction with the IRS, whatever. It's totally up to you. Um, you can do that. If you want to give anonymously, that's completely fine as well. Oh, one last thing. I forgot to mention this. It also has to do with, you know, you bring your tithes into the church. There's a lot of new methods of collecting money and stuff. And, like, we have a PayPal button on our, on our webpage. So that, because, like, some people like to d donate money and give money. People listen online or whatever. It's an easy way, especially these days. You do, you know, paying all your bills and stuff online. Um, we're never going to have a bill pay system for you to pay your tithe if you, you know, to, to give to the church. I'm never going to set that up. I mean, we'll have the donation there available. But two reasons. One is because they charge a fee. You may not realize that, but when you're giving, if you're, if you're going like, to pay a tithe to PayPal, you better know how much they're going to take back because the church doesn't actually get the full amount. They get an amount less their service fee, which is a few percent. So right off the bat, you're, you know, if you're thinking you're paying the whole thing, you're not necessarily doing it. But the other thing is I do think it's important to bring your tithe to the church. And, and if there's people listening on the internet, you know, I appreciate that we, we always appreciate the gifts to, to help out the work that we're doing here and, and to bring forth the Lord. But I, but I strongly believe that, that everyone should be bringing their tithes to their local church and should find a local church that they go to and they bring, you know, as much as we appreciate gifts, I'd rather have people just do things the right way. And the right way is, hey, give your money to your local church. Support your, I mean, whoever you're a part of, whatever church you go to, support them. Find the best church you can, someone who's, and if you're not willing, if you, if you, if you can't even support them with the little, like, I mean, money's not that important, to be honest. And if you can't support them in that way, then you need to find another church. Move here. That's right. Amen. If, if you can't find a church good enough, to, to, even, to even be willing to say, I, I, I don't even think that I could do this. Like, I, don't, I just don't think that it would be right that I'd even be giving a tithe by paying to this church. Then, then you got to move and just go to, a, go to another church. Amen. So, anyways, I hope that was helpful. Like I said, I don't, I don't touch on this very often, but it, it's, it's in the Bible. It's, it's completely it's scriptural, so I'm going to preach as often as I need to, as, as often as God brings up the subject of money and things like that. We'll talk about it, I'll preach it, and, and we'll prove it from scripture. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for, uh, for your instruction, Lord, and I pray that um, 
You'd help us all to, to decide for ourselves what the, what's the right thing to do in, in every area of our life, dear Lord, whether it comes from our finances, our, you know, every, every decision that we make in this life, dear Lord, help us to, to make the decision based off of what your word's saying. Dear God, I pray you please help us have integrity and not to, to have our heart in the wrong places and to cling to, to our money, no matter how much or how little of it we have, dear Lord. Help us not to, to be greedy in that sense, but just to be able to, to be willing to to give it to you. And, and, and we know that you're able to bless even the littlest amount. People want to think that, oh, I don't have very much money. Even a tithe from me is only going to be a few dollars. Maybe that's the case. But we saw what you're able to do with the five loaves and two fishes, dear God. We know that you're a God that can multiply things and, and into, great, into greatness, God. And that um, what you really require from us is just our faith and our obedience. And um, Lord, help us to, to have both of those things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.